Okay, Unitarian Universalism is a religion. And it actually helps to understand, I think, from the get-go that how we define religion might be a little different than how you do. Because Unitarian Universalists don't define religion as an unchanging, rock-solid system of how everything came to be and what the absolute truth is. For us, religion is community and values, and it's a living tradition of faith. It's living, which means that it grows and changes along with us. So I'm going to start by taking you way, way back, way back. People have always created myths, right? Humans from the beginning of time have always told stories about why things happen. Think about gods of ancient Greece or Egypt or India, stories about ancestors in Africa. We have always tried to explain life and death and natural phenomena like seasons or earthquakes or storms with stories about what they mean. Now we have a story called science, right? But for many, many, many hundreds of years, we didn't have that. And we needed ways of engaging with and making sense of the world around us, especially the biggest mysteries, like why are we here? Why do we die? Why do we have to face pain? And how do we respond to beautiful and incredible and miraculous things that happen? And so all over the world, these myths unfolded in different ways to explain these big questions. Each culture and people developed different symbols and stories that formed the basis of different religions to explain the world. None of these religions were less true than the other, but they all pointed at a bigger truth than any one person or any one system of belief could quite capture on its own because the mysteries are just too big. That's how Unitarian Universalists see all of the different religions of the world, including our own. Each one is a collection of symbols and stories that are important to a particular group of people to answer those big questions. And so in different places in the world at different times, different religions emerge, none of them untrue, just none of them the whole truth including our own faith. Our tradition emerged out of one of those other traditions, out of Christianity. Now, if you live in America, it's likely that that is one religion you know at least something about. There's sort of a cultural Christianity all around us here, right? Christmas is a national holiday. The Easter Bunny takes pictures with kids at the mall. This isn't because Christianity is more correct it's just because for most of our country's history, it's been the majority religion. The core of Christianity begins 2000 years ago when it emerged out of another tradition, out of Judaism. Many people don't realize Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He lived in the area we now call Israel and Palestine. And Jesus was raised as a Jew but over the course of his life, he developed and he taught a whole bunch of new interpretations of the symbols and the stories that he had been raised with. He did amazing things and he shared life-changing wisdom with people, so much so that people started to say he must be a prophet sent from God or a Messiah or a savior or even God himself incarnated. So when Jesus was killed by the Roman government for his teachings, People continue to talk about him. We still talk about him today. And a whole religion grew up around what he did and who he was. Now, believe it or not, the origins of modern Unitarian Universalism actually stretch back all the way to that moment. In the decades, the first few tens and hundreds of years, the earliest days after Jesus's death, there were debates about what I just mentioned, debates about who he really was. Was he the son of God or was he even one and the same with God, part of something called the Holy Trinity that you might have heard of? That position, that doctrine of the Trinity, that didn't become an official position of the Christian church until about 300 years after Jesus died. In the early days, the Christian church was not the organized body that we think of today. It was a movement. It was spread out and decentralized. It was a collection of these 
small and often persecuted communities in different places across the Middle East and Southern Europe and Africa, places like Rome and Corinth, right? If you know the Christian New Testament, think about the names of some of those books. Those were all the names of places and people that Paul was writing to. Paul was one of Jesus's first followers, and he wrote to the different communities of Christians in these cities to help them figure out how to be Christians, because Christianity was new, right? Corinthians were people who lived in Corinth. Ephesians lived in Ephesus. And this is 2,000 years ago, so there was no way for these disparate communities to stay in close contact, except traveling great distances or sending letters. And so because they were spread out, a lot of diverse ideas flourished. Diverse beliefs and practices developed within and between those different communities. You know, one of the first things I learned in divinity school is that Christianity is an argument. It's closer to say, really, that there are Christianities, plural, rather than one Christianity, because there have always been different versions and expressions of the tradition in different places. And so since the beginning, there were people in that Christian fold who had what's called a low Christology. Low, think of that as maybe closer to earth. They believed that Jesus was closer to human than God. Maybe he was a prophet or divinely inspired with special wisdom, or just a great teacher who showed us a new way, but he wasn't part of a trinity, not a God, not one and the same with God. Or there were some people early on who believed that God was in Jesus in the same way that God is in all of us in you and me. It was just that Jesus knew it on this different level and lived it so much more clearly, and that changed the impact he had. So the Roman Empire, they ruled all of those cities, nearly all of those places where the early Christians had gathered. And a few centuries after Jesus's death, they decided to make Christianity their official state religion. So the Roman government called councils of these church leaders from all these different places together, basically to say, let's set down some rules, finally, for this religion. One of those councils was called the Council of Nicaea, which wrote the Nicene Creed. You might know that one if you grew up Christian. And over time, these councils and church leaders, they built up an official church doctrine for Christianity, which made everything outside of that official church doctrine a heresy. This is an important thing to remember about how Unitarian Universalism got started. We can actually trace our roots back to those first heretics because there have always been heretics in and around Christianity as part of the natural diversity in how people experience and express their faith. Among those earliest Christian heretics, some of them argued two points. One, that God was not three persons, but one. And two, that perhaps God's relationship with Jesus is not that different from God's relationship to you and me. Perhaps Jesus was pointing the way to salvation, not through him alone, but through all of us and how we live, how we work while we are alive to save each other. These are the earliest ancestors of the Unitarian and Universalist movements. Now it's true that those names are more modern. It took another thousand years or so before anyone started using Unitarian or Universalist as words to describe those beliefs. But through all the various heresies in history, through the mystic Christians in the medieval days, the whole new burst of ideas that came from the Protestant Reformation, eventually writers and preachers with Unitarian and Universalist ideas started to get organized. Now, they often did this in the face of a lot of persecution because they were heretics, right? So part of why UUism is still mostly an American religious movement, it's mostly practiced here in the United States, it's because this was one of the first places with religious freedom. And people traveled from other places in the world so that they could build organized religious communities here without persecution. By the time they reached America, Unitarians had organized mostly around that idea that God was one, not three, and that Jesus was more human and less supernatural, a wise teacher and a model of character for us all. 
Universalists actually focused less on Jesus by that time and more on God, saying that God loves not just Jesus, but every single one of us as beloved children. And that love of God, that capital L love, is great enough to save us all. No one is damned. All of us come from and are welcomed back into God's own heart. Both traditions flourished in the young, hungry, new United States. You might not even realize Unitarianism was very influential in early America. The family of our second and fourth presidents, John Adams and John Quincy Adams, were both Unitarians. And well into the 1800s, it kept growing here thanks to the influence of Unitarian writers like Ralph Waldo Emerson, activists for the abolition of slavery, for women's rights, and for Universalists who were really active in movements for social change. Clara Barton, for example, was a Civil War nurse who founded the American Red Cross. She was a Universalist. It's striking, I think, that when we tell our tradition's history today, as you use, we do often focus on these people who did great things. And I think that that's in part because over time, both traditions moved from being communities of faith that were most concerned about what people believed to communities that were most concerned about what our beliefs call us to do in the world, who our values call us to be for ourselves and for each other. If we are all equal and beloved, if we are all capable of growth and compassion and character, then that has a profound impact on how seriously we take our lives and the lives and well-being of our neighbors. Over the course of the 1900s, Unitarian and Universalist churches were going through a bit of a sea change around this, a bit of an evolution. They had long considered themselves part of this Christian family, this long tradition of Jesus followers. But they'd also spent hundreds of years at this point on the far progressive edge of any kind of mainstream Christianity. As the two denominations found themselves working together on more and more issues and social movements, on labor and economic justice and voting rights and gay rights issues, they decided to merge and start their own new religious movement. And so the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, was officially created in 1961 from the merger of the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America. And they did something really interesting in taking this final step, which is that they dropped their formal identification as a Christian denomination. Again, they decided at this point that the focus would be on our shared values and principles and what those values call us to do in the world, rather than on a creed or a set of scriptures that tell us the story of how things came to be. Now, it's important, I think, to know it's not that we can believe anything we want as you use. We have really clear values and beliefs. It's just that our most important beliefs are not so much about what happened long ago and far away, or which ancient stories are true. Our most important beliefs are about the value and the worth of people in the world right now, and about how we should treat each other as a result. It's a really different way to understand religion for some people, I know, but it makes sense for us. So I hope that this video has helped you understand a little bit more about where Unitarian Universalism comes from. Thank you for watching.